Thanks. And now we are welcoming our third speaker for today's session, uh, Mr. Jonathan Harris. Um, Mr. Jonathan, are you here? Hello. Can you hear me? Can you open the mic, please? I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Can yes. Can you hear me now? Good. Yes. Yes, clear. Um, we'll welcome Mr. Jonathan Harris uh, in, in the session today. Um, Actually, I met uh, Mr. Jonathan early this year in Dubai, MidLab, and uh, his talk was inspiring me a lot in the, um, in the, in the challenging um, that he, he faced with his team during the competency and training uh, where there is uh, no connectivity in, uh, in, the, in the hospital. Um, uh, so, Mr. Jonathan graduated from the University of Ireland, Galway, in 1997 with a degree in physiology and biochemistry. He obtained an honor degree specializing in biochemistry with the University of Wolverhampton in the United Kingdom a year later. He began his career in Black Rock Clinic, the largest and longest open private hospital in Ireland as medical scientist in immunology. Uh, and he hold a master's in biomedical science with the University of Ulster in Coloraine, Northern Ireland. He is a fellow of the Academy of Medical Laboratory Science in Ireland. He was employed as a senior medical scientist in the blood science department at the Hermitage Medical Clinic in Dublin for six years which included responsibility for the point of care testing. In 2014, he was employed as a POCT manager in the newly built Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi. Jonathan was responsible for setting up and establishing the point of care department. The department achieved CAB accreditation within six months of opening. In 2016, the POCT program achieved ISO 22870 accreditation within the United Kingdom Accreditation Service, the first in the Middle East and in North America, to achieve this. Jonathan is currently employed by National Reference Laboratory and continues to manage the POCT program at Cleveland. Jonathan has produced a number of publications relating to point-of-care testing in journals and magazines. He is a regular contributor to conferences in the region. He is currently completing a Master's in Healthcare Leadership and Innovation with the Royal College of Surgeon Ireland. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Jonathan, and the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Malak, for the introduction, and thank you to the Saudi Kim Society for the invitation. And today, Dr. Malak, I'm going to talk a little bit more about training and competency, and we have some more updates for you. So the objectives today are um, we're going to look back um, uh, to 2014 when we arrived in CCD and how we established. Can you please the raise the voice? Program. And then we're going to look at what we're doing currently um, to manage our training and competency today. And finally, I'm going to share with you um, our plan for further... Mr. Uh, Jonathan, further can you please raise the voice? Sure. So competency issues typically um, top the deficiency list for accreditation bodies and inspections. Um, and there's a reason for this. Because competency, out of all the various elements of a point of care program, are the most difficult to manage. And why is that? Because typically for a large point of care program, you have to train hundreds or thousands of staff with various skills and mindsets and attitudes and behaviors. And typically as well, with the broad scope, you have a wide variety of technologies and methodologies um, of different complexities, which is quite difficult to manage. And then we have the issue then of how to manage this waived versus non-waived, um, which comes from the College of American Pathologists, 
um, in relation to frequency of assessments and also what needs to be assessed during that competency evaluation. And then we have to deal with staff as well who are clinically focused on patients and sometimes see the requirement for competency as a burden, um, an additional burden that they have to enjoy. Finally, the most important one is how to administer the program. Um, how to organize and manage a large point of care competency program is very difficult. And then you have the six elements of competency as well. Um, so I'll briefly discuss these because they're important to know because they're, they're vital in the, um, in the evidence capture that we need when we do competency assessment um, frequently. So what are they? There's, they are the direct observation, the witness test, if you like, um, seeing the specimen collection um, and processing uh, done at the patient's bedside, the monitoring and recording of QC and patient tests, um, which is quite difficult when you have a system that is completely manual, for example, and very error prone. Much simpler and efficient when it's connected and interfaced, for example. Documentation review, doing what we say and say what we do. If it's not documented, it's very hard to enforce something. Then we have the maintenance checks or functions checks that's associated with the devices. The blind testing that's done on a sample of known value previously or proficiency testing. And then finally the troubleshooting or assessing people's um, problem solving skills and that's done in, in a number of ways. This is the scope um, of COCT in Cleveland Clinic. We have 120 glucometers, we have nine blood gas machines, three HPA1C analyzers, we have three creatinine meters for the imaging department, we have PTINR meters in use in the coagulation department and the emergency department, activated clotting time used in the uh, CVOR and in the cath labs, thromboelastographs used also in the, um, in the CVOR for coagulation management, we do teardrop testing for dry eye syndrome, sweat testing for cystic fibrosis, and then in addition to that we have urinalysis and pregnancy testing and physician form testing for microscopies and also um, ocular blood testing in the emergency department as well. So looking at the scope that we had and knowing what the requirements were and the expectations from us um, when we arrived, the question was asked how are we going to meet all these requirements for training and competency? Where do we begin? Before I go into detail, I want to give you a snapshot or an overview um, of where we came and where we are today. So in 2015, we began the training program. Then in 2016, two big things happened. We procured the COVID Academy um, exam portal, um, and we also implemented recertification on smaller different devices. In 2017, we established a key performance indicator for recertification. 2018, we had some good news and we had some bad news. The COVID Academy um, was withdrawn due to um, no, no, no further support from the vendor. And then we began to look at um, a learning management system to replace that. And then in 2019, we had a CI project for the entire year. And we migrated fully uh, for all our point of care devices to a learning management system. And finally, this year, we are looking to interface our LMS to the H HR portal in the hospital, where the LMS will be feeding into um, the, past, the, the staff member's electronic training uh, file in the hospital. So let's go back to the start. So from 2014 to 2016, we had a completely paper-based system. And this is my friend here, Luz, who worked with me closely, and I just want to give her a shout out today and, and thank her for all that she does to, uh, to help us ensure we have a compliant program to UCT. Thank you, Luz. But everything was completely paper. Um, even though we did have some uh, middleware solutions in place, there was no real way of capturing the um, competency components separately um, and, and provide evidence um, in a file, if you like, in real time for assessors or the regulators should they arise. The um, alternative that we had was um, a paper-based system, um, but quickly that uh, became unsustainable because of the scope of the program, and as time went on, more and more staff members were arriving into the hospital 
the whole thing became difficult, if not impossible, to manage. We were looking for something new. So we adopted the Copus Academy um, software, which is an exam portal um, that feeds into the Roche middleware system. And what Copus Academy did was it did two things for us. The first thing for the Roche devices was it provided a complete electronic solution um, for competency management um, and evidence uh, availability to assessors. And here you can see how that works in practice. Number one, the Copus IT system, which is the middleware application for the PUC devices, could capture quality control and witness, test, witness testing done um, at the point of care. And at the same time, the Copus Academy, which is a separate system, could um, facilitate exams at the point of care remotely by nurses. And together, um, when they were completed, would um, provide completion certificates. Um, which could then be available for the nurses, which they then uploaded manually themselves into, the, uh, into their HR uh, training files. And this system was also auto-certifying, auto like, it was like a circle. Um, once everything was completed, they were pushed through to the following year. So that was one part. And the second part then was for the non-ROSH devices, for the rest of the scope, COVID Academy was all that we had. So that provided the exam component, if you like, which met a certain number, uh, which met some of the requirements of the six elements, and then the rest continued to be a paper-based solution. So still there was a lot of paper, and it still was um, difficult to manage, but less so than before. Another thing we introduced during the month, or during the year of 2016, was dedicated recertification month, because we discovered, discovered quite quickly um, with large numbers of staff in the hospital arriving at different times and expiring at different times, um, we quickly discovered that we could not manage um, the research certifications for the entire hospital for all the scope in real time but on an individual basis for each nurse. And we had to look at something else. So what we did was we created a dedicated research certification month for each device. And that really did help us transform the management um, of the competencies and competency renewals for our PhD program. And there you can see in blue, we have all the devices that are the waves, if you like, and they are um, assessed for competency once annually. And if you look at the green, if you like, they're the non-waved, um, and the expectations requirements are that they're done, um, competency assessment is done three times in the first year, and then annually thereafter as well. So we have a bespoke model here, um, dependent on the type of, or the classification um, of each point of care device, waived or non-waived. And then, when we start to manage the process better, then we start to try and challenge ourselves as well. Um, and we created key performance indicators. We started off at a lofty 90%, um, which we achieved in 20, which we achieved in 2019, or in 2018, rather. And now we have upped our KPI um, benchmark to 92.5% last year, and which we have met uh, for the most part for our entire scope. And by having key performance indicators, we share this data with the nurses locally. And through the transparency, sharing the data with nurses periodically through the, the, the dedicated recertification month, um, we bring accountability, and then we can bring compliance. And then in 2018, we had a step backwards. Even though the system that we had was imperfect, it was a lot better than what we had at the outset. And we were informed by the vendors that this um, very important exam portal was being withdrawn from the market and would be no, no longer supported. So this, this brought about a period of reflection for us because we really were at a loss um, as to where we would go. Um, you know, how we proceed, considering this played a vital part and, and facilitated us, facilitated the recertification month and facilitated us achieving some very nice compliance rates with their uh, KPIs. But thankfully, all was not lost. And, and you know, really, when something, something, you know, profound or something bad happens, it brings um, a period of reflection. And, and during that period of reflection, we, 
we, we looked out outwards in the hospital to see what might be available to us, and that led to discussions with our um, nursing education colleagues. And we discovered that perhaps there was an opportunity for us to use another application um, that we were not aware of at the outset. And this was the learning management system. So now, um, before I just discuss LMS, what do we have now? We have, a, again, another hybrid model um, using LMS, where LMS is feeding into PUCT middleware and, provo and providing certificates of completion automatically, albeit with some manual steps. And then the other, the other, um, um, the other part that we have is, a, is complete reliance of L on LMS exclusively for the remainder of the devices that are not linked to our middleware. So two systems, LMS connected to middleware, and then the other is complete LMS reliance. So what is a learning management system? Well, it's a complete solution that manages all elements um, related to training and management. We have our e-learning component, which provides videos and PowerPoint presentations. And then we can customize and build courses for all or for all our point of care devices dependent on our, our, our local, local needs and requirements. And we can assess and evaluate these courses remotely ourselves and in real time, which has been transformational for us. We can also issue completion certificates from our desk to the different nurses, and they can download at the time of their choosing. We can also track um, who has done what, where, and when by the click of a button. And also, we can uh, pull up reports for nurse managers as well, so they can see how their staff are, are doing locally and how they're compliant. And this also has replaced our previous training tracker, where we had a manual Excel spreadsheet, because that's a CAP and ISO requirement that we should document who was trained in what and when, a complete historical review, if you like. And now the LMS has replaced that, and we can produce these this evidence in real time through the LMS system that's available to us. Here is some um, screenshots from LMS just to give you a flavor um, of what it looks like and what it, and what it does. We have two types of courses for each device. We have our initial training, which is always face-to-face -face and incorporates a component of LMS. And then we have the annual recertification, which can be done remotely with trainers um, on the floors. And here you can see in, in, in the image here, you can see when the courses were created, um, the name of the various courses, um, the number of staff that have been enrolled in the courses, um, when the, if the course has been published or is it still in progress, hasn't been built yet. And also, for example, the waiting list there, this, this, this um, facilitates when classroom training occurs and people need to book a place in the classroom session. And for example, if there's 10, 10 uh, slots available, well, then the 10 person put in a waiting list. And we can see this virtually. And we can assign them then to the second classroom training um, whenever that may happen. Here is a screenshot of um, an initial training course. Um, and on this occasion, this is a glucometer. Initial training for the glucose meters here. And there you can see the different components um, from, from the course, starting with the uh, GNO or General Nurse Orientation Checklist. And that gives them a list of things um, and a roadmap, if you like, what's expected from them and what they need to do. So they know quickly what's expected from them. Then they have an up-to-date um, version of the procedure, which is linked to the electronic documentation system in the hospital, where they review that, click it, mark it as read, um, and that's updated. They can review some online videos and presentations. They need to complete the quiz and achieve a pass mark of 80%. And finally, for the initial training component, they must upload their papers, which is reviewed virtually by nursing clinic instructors or ourselves as well. On a high level, you can, you can get um, a bird's eye view, if you like, um, of where we are for the different courses. So for example, in this screenshot here, you can see that 94 staff have been assigned for the glucometer course. Um, and 86 have completed it, and five are outstanding. Um, further below there, you can see another screenshot that I embedded on the image, um, where 
initially we had three people who were outstanding to complete the course, and then over time how that uh, went down to zero. So we can see, you know, at a very granular level, who needs to do what and where, and we can follow up as needed. And here is another image where we can see um, a list, a, a, another list looking at, for example, in one department, who, who's outstanding for what, or what they did and when. So for example here, the first caregiver, for example, is 80% completed and has tasks outstanding. The last two there, for example, as well, they've, they've completed all the needful um, and they uh, have, have achieved 100% in their tasks. We can look at the individual level as well, where you can look at a specific account um, and you can see exactly where the person is. So, for example, a nurse manager may contact us and ask us where is that, that caregiver on the, on the completion of their certificate or of their competency. So we can see, um, you know, when they first started, where they are, and when they need um, and have the completion or when they need to complete or what is, what is outstanding. And finally, all of these courses are overseen and evaluated by either a nursing instructor in nursing education or by the point of care team as well. So where are we now with LMS and the middleware? So I just want to quickly explain this to you uh, because this is, this is the way we're going to go in the future. Um, we're going to completely automate this process so we can automate um, the certificates completely. So currently it's a manual, it's, it's, it's a mixture of manual and automation. So number one there on the LMS, you can see, for example, that the exam must be completed. Then we must translate the exam scores on the LMS into a language that the Copus IT system will understand. And then that report uploaded to Copus IT, for example. And there then it tracks all the other uh, requirements of competency. And if everything has been completed, including the exam component which has just been uploaded, well, then a, a completion certificate will be um, released from Corpus IT. And then the point of care team here will issue completion certificates from the LMS. And this is sent back um, to the nurses um, via LMS. So at the moment, it's a mixture of, of automation and pushing things through from one system to the other manually. But we're going to automate this very soon. So what are the plans for the future? Where are we going to take this next? Before I discuss that, we've just upgraded our, one of our middleware systems to Infinity Pox. So we've gone from Copus IT system to um, an upgraded version called Infinity Pox, which is a completely new look and feel software, which is much more uh, user friendly for our point of care coordinators. But it has some very important features, which is going to facilitate um, a much more efficient and streamlined process for training and competency management. And what is that? Well, the most important thing is that it's LDAP uh, compatible, which means lightweight directory access protocol. You don't really need to understand that, but what it means in short is that is the POCT middleware can upload all the nursing uh, information automatically um, through an interaction with the LDAP, which is another software program available in the hospital. So you're, now you're automating the importation um, of all the user information. So that's another transformation, if you like, because no longer do we have to enter the, the staff member's information manually. So this will facilitate fast registration of staff on the system. So no longer are we registration, re registering them. We are just activating them with the click of a button. And this will also allow us to automatically deactivate staff who have left the hospital. So that when they leave, the day they leave the hospital, they will automatically be deactivated uh, from the system and their access to the devices will be removed also. And also it allows for people who are using organization-wide passwords, they can use the same passwords when using Infinity Access. But most importantly, the final point it is automating the communication between the Infinity or the point of care middleware and the LMS. So this was the, this was the um, transformation or the key point, the key outstanding point that we were looking for. So what will the, the future state look like? And we're looking to have this implemented in the first quarter of next year. So let's start with number one. 
through auto mapping, we have identified which nurses need to do which courses and where via LMS, so that when they arrive in the organization, through their position number, we know what courses they have to do, and the LMS will assign that to them. Number two, the point of care coordinator will grant them access, if you like, activate them, that we talked about, so it'll be already on the system. And then, look at number three, you've got the middleware and LMS talking to each other, where the LMS um, exam components will talk to the middleware system, and the middleware system will capture that along with all the other competency requirements that's needed as well. So number four, you have that two-way traffic, if you like, between the two systems. And number five, once the complete certificate has been done, LMS will talk to Mawarid, which is the, um, the HR um, electronic system which captures all the competencies, core competencies for nursing in the hospital. And now what you have is the point of care curses courses, which will be um, part of the core competency of nurses, an expectation that they must complete in time. And if they do not, nurse managers will be notified. And this information will feed into the, the nurses' appraisal process annually. Reflections um, on, on all of this. This is major change, um, and we change leaders must lead. And people will be, and people will always resist change and some will embrace it. So my advice is to have a positive outlook because this whole process, this whole journey, this con continual improvement project for us has been the highs and lows and you have to be positive and have a positive mental attitude throughout to bring your people with you. And you need to be flexible because, you know, we initially, the, the communication between our middlewares and LMS wasn't perfect, but we wanted to try to see if it was possible. So we need to be flexible and, and we need to be, you know, agile. Uh, and be able to change um, as different things present themselves. We need to be accountable to our staff. And finally, we need to be empathetic. And we need to listen to people's concerns uh, and, and listen to them uh, and take whatever issue they have on board. A lot of this has been summarized in a journal that we published in June of this year, um, which is free to download. And all of those of you, uh, all of you who, are, who have to manage a training and competency, and uh, have a large PhD program, I recommend that you read this. So my, my, my key takeaway message for you is there is no exclusive way of managing training and competency. Um, this is what we have done here. Research certification months have, you know, made our compliance much more manageable. KPIs have brought transparency and accountability to local managers in managing recertifications and ensure that they're done on time. Our learning management system and its integration with our middleware has not only facilitated improvement but transformed the management. And vendors need to do more because we do have other middleware applications as well and we want to do the same for them next year too. And we have a lot more improvements um, in the year ahead that we don't have time to talk about today. But one thing that is vital to facilitate all this improvement is IT integration, which we're very lucky to have in Cleveland Clinic. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Jonathan, for your presentation. Thank you so much for your presentation. And um, it's a time now for question uh, and answers from the speakers. Um, Is there any questions? Well, uh, I have a question to Dr. Adil Khan. Dr. Adil, are you with us? Can you hear me? Okay, I got a question here. How can I register in POCT courses that you mentioned? Uh, this qu this question to who exactly? Um, 
Well, um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, there's another you, question to Mr. Harris. Could can you, you share with us your question? Yes, yes, Dr. Adil, we can hear you. Um, okay, so um, for some reason, to the webcam is working, but... I can hear you, doctor. Hello, yes? Okay, uh, yeah, the question is, could you share with us your cross-checking practices to assure the reliability of these too many POCT devices? Um, I don't get the, uh, the question, actually. Um, OK. Um, there is a question about the courses that you mentioned during the presentation. Can you share it with the audience? Okay. Um, I have a question to Dr. Adil. Um, since, since, since the pandemic started, there's a lot of debates about the accuracy of point of care of COVID-19 testing. Um, I just want to know your perspective um, on the accuracy area, uh, comparing the result between the POCT COVID and the lab result of uh, PCR lab result. Okay, so for uh, Dr. Adel, can you first of all hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. He yes, can you I can hear me? Hear you. Uh, I can. Yeah, you can. Okay. Yes. So, in in terms of um, the reliability of the results, they should be um, generally uh, speaking about ninety nine. Um, the specificity for uh, PCR should be 99% and for uh, the sensitivity should be uh, 95%. Um, that, that's um, what um, the, the recommendations are. Um, something like an infectious disease as, as uh, serious as COVID, um, you've got um, sensitivity which is 80%. That's uh, uh, that can be quite disastrous. So, you know, the, in, in terms of uh, uh, the correlation between the lab results and the point of care test, they should be uh, equivalent. And, and if you don't have that, then it's better to send uh, okay. a sample to the lab. Stop below. Thank you. Is well, there's another, another question regarding the cutoff. Thanks. Yes, yes, thank you, Dr. Adel. Uh, there is another question regarding the cutoff validation. Uh, what are the appropriate material to be used for patient samples or control materials? Is that to me? Yes, Doctor. Well, I think that, uh, that they didn't it's, mention it's any, that it's just a question, so. So it's regarding so the cutoff validation, what are the, what are the appropriate can material the can be used? Yeah, the, yeah uh, regarding the cutoff validation, what are the appropriate material can be used? Is it patient samples or control materials? Well, the cutoff validation, I think there are, uh, they, they, they mean the AMR? The question is not clear for me as well. Is it cl yeah, clear for you, Najwa? You should use patient samples. I think what they mean about the cutoff is uh, uh, the value which around the clinical decision uh, have to be given. Like, for example, in the troponin, there is a cutoff value in, uh, in the COVID. Uh, testing um, yeah. uh, how to define negative and positive but uh, generally yeah. in accreditation uh, validation has to be done uh, the accuracy of the 
the accuracy uh, part has to be done with a patient testing sample. Uh, some some material which is uh, have the same matrix effect, so it has to be a, a patient uh, sample. Yes. Okay, let's see if there's any other questions. Uh... Uh, I see a question about the improvement, the uh, project improvement project. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, so uh, there were a question about uh, an improvement project. Uh, I don't know directed to whom, but I can share one of the improvement projects we did uh, for point of care. We had a problem with the documentation of the critical result for the glucose testing. Um, uh, Non-laboratorian thought that because it is done in the, in the presence of the doctor and the nurse, they don't need to document the action for the critical result. So we started assessing, and the first assessment it was only like 40% compliance uh, of the total. So we started with the assessing and we raising the bar through the education, through. Uh, but it took us like a, a year through that project to get it up to the 80 and then the 95. So it's it was a very slow and long process. But it, it paid off. So this is one example of an improvement project, which related to the patient uh, safety. Hi, Dr. Malik. Hi. Hi, Dr. Malik. Yes, I'm hearing. Hi, yeah, there's, there's one question here relating to, um, yeah, there's one question here relating to um, cross-checking practice um, that one of the, um, Zeros is asked. So there's two things in relation to cross check. Number one is the classification of the test if it waved or non waved. So if it's a non waved device, like for example, blood gases, there's an expectation that you must do um, twice annually an instrument comparison. And that can be done with either QC material or with sufficiency testing sample results. Okay? So that's one way that you can address the cross checking requirement for non waved. And then annually for the wave testing for, for example, our glucometer devices, we, we compare our PT results for glucometers and we compare the results from one meter to the other. So to answer that viewer's question, that's one way that you could meet um, the cross-checking requirements to ensure that all the devices or meters are um, performing in a similar way within an allowable hour, each of each other. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for the excellent presentation and take home messages and the recommendations during this session for all, from all of you. And uh, thank you for the audience and the, all the uh, people here. So it's a time to uh, end up this uh, session now and uh, we'll see you in the next session later. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.
يعطيكم العافيه يعطيكم العافيه كان بس الله دكتور زاهر ممكن تحط سماعة يا دكتور انا حطيت سماعة الان كيف سامعني الان؟ انا حطيت سماعة تمام اسمعك نعم واضح دكتور انور ممكن تحط سماعة يا دكتور عشان في صوت صدى بيطلع من عندك ما انا ما عندي سماعة حقيقة انا عملت تيستنج اليوم من دون سماعة ما في اي سماعة عندك يا دكتور؟ لا والله ما عندي دحين انا ما عندي اي سماعة طيب تمام خلاص خلاص ان شاء الله تمشي الامور ان شاء الله طيب احنا معنا بريك للساعة 3 للساعة 8 35 دقيقة ونبدأ إن شاء الله. ما حنكون متأخرين كذا الجدول؟ آه آه عشان بس آه السيشن اللي قبل آه مدوا شوي يعني تأخروا شوي في هذا فأعطينا أعطينا بس بريك للمشتركين شوية وكذا وبعدين بنبدأ إن شاء الله. طيب أقدر أقدر أشيك على البرزنتيشن أتأكد إنه الأنيميشن ماشي كويس؟ تفضل يا دكتور. غمض عيونك يا ابو عبد الله. غمض عيونك يا ابو عبد الله. ايوه غمض ما عندك مشكلة. كيف حالك؟ الحمد لله كيف حالك طيب؟ الحمد لله كيف حالك طيب؟ الله يسلمك. يلا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم، السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. أشكركم على تواجدكم معنا اليوم في في المستشفى. السادس لاجتماع الجمعية السعودية الكيمياء السريرية. Uh, I would like to thank all of you to stay until this time to attend the sixth session uh, we have today for the Saudi uh, Society for Clinical Chemistry. Um, and uh, I would like to start with uh, our first speaker in this session. The session will be about general clinical chemistry. Uh, and uh, I'll be the moderator. My name is Anwar Burai, and I'm a consultant clinical uh, scientist in National Guard Hospital in Jeddah. Uh, our first speak speaker will be uh, Dr. Zahir Al-Shahri. Uh, Dr. Zahir Al-Shahri is consultant clinical scientist in clinical biochemistry and laboratory and pathology, uh, and pathology of clinical laboratory medicine administration in King Fahad Medical City. Uh, his laboratory operation lead during uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, at uh, Diria Hospital Riyadh King uh, in, in, in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, he's the director of Saudi board for clinical biochemistry program in uh, King Fahad Medical City, and he's a member of the evaluation uh, of the professional certificates for clinical laboratory at uh, Saudi Commission for Health Specialities. He's a member of the Saudi Laboratory Specialist uh, Licensure Examinations Committees uh, in the Saudi, uh, committee, Saudi Commission for, uh, for Health Specialities. And he's a head of uh, points of care testing, phlebotomy, sample send out and sample processing section in uh, King Fahad Medical uh, City. Uh, and he obtained uh, his uh, master uh, and PhD uh, 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 from uh, Melbourne, uh, Australia. Uh, his BC, his uh, uh, bachelor's uh, degree was uh, from King Abdul Aziz University of Jeddah. Um, welcome, Dr. Zahir, and uh, uh, you can first start. I will start with the introduction, then uh, go to establishment of the automation, what is uh, how to start, and what are the challenges. Then uh, I will uh, go through some consideration that should be taken uh, before and during and after uh, establishment. 
uh, so uh, uh, in 1950, uh, uh, the first kit was introduced by uh, Dr. Oliver Lowry. Uh, uh, it was uh, for alkaline phosphatase. It was the first methodology peri packaged uh, uh, method. Uh, it was ready to use uh, uh, a SARE agent uh, with an instruction on how to use. In 1957, the first lab automation was introduced by uh, Dr. Leonardo Skiggs uh, for analysis of blood uh, urea nitrogen. In 1981, uh, Professor Masahadi Sasaki um, uh, tray, uh, uh, was the first um, uh, uh, to, to introduce automated, uh, full automated lab in, in the world. He trained his medical technologists to uh, build uh, conveyor belts, construct electronic uh, board, uh, and uh, program robots. He presented this achievement in uh, the American Association of Clinical Chemistry in 1989. Uh, so uh, yesterday, uh, Professor Graham talked about how complex is the healthcare system nowadays, uh, uh, and mentioned that uh, aging of population uh, advancement in the in the medicine, uh, uh, increased number of chronic disease, uh, put a lot of pressure on the on the on the health uh, system, which become very complex uh, system. And uh, the governments and uh, insurance companies uh, have to pay a lot of uh, money to uh, uh, for this uh, uh, complex healthcare system. Uh, this drive the companies, the the government and uh, uh, insurance company to uh, to focus on uh, do, do more uh, efforts with less uh, uh, budget, which lead to uh, many initiatives, uh, starting with consolidation of services, uh, utilization of uh, current resources, um, improvement of services quality uh, to achieve or uh, to meet the uh, government and uh, community expectations with less involvement of medical technologists and the staff. So uh, the automation concept arise uh, to, so, uh, to help in, in, in laboratory to help uh, achieve uh, this goal, do more with less. Uh, the automation is um, a customized process that may range from automation, uh, from automating only a few steps of the analytical process to total laboratory automation, depending on the needs and resources of each uh, laboratory. Uh, of course, it includes pre-analytical, analytical and post-analytical process. This concept based on the minimal human input in the, work, in the workflow of the sample uh, process from receiving to uh, resulting. Uh, this layout represents a very, very simple uh, representation of uh, automation concept, which start with the input output module where the sample uh, entered and uh, the barcode reads, uh, then uh, sent to the centrifuge to, uh, to, be sent, uh, to be spun and go to the decaber to remove the cap and uh, after that, uh, go to the analyzer to, to be tested for the test required uh, and go back to the recapper where it will, re it will recap uh, or seal with the aluminum foil, then go back to the refrigerator for archiving. Whenever the, uh, uh, the need for retrieve the sample uh, for uh, doing more uh, tests or uh, reflex tests, uh, the, uh, the sample will take uh, retrieved out from the unit, go to the decapper again, uh, to remove the, the seal or the cap and go to, uh, to the analyzers for further investigation. Uh, it also have a helicopter or sorter where it can help to sort samples that need to be done outside or offline uh, from the automation uh, or for uh, sent out or uh, to be run as batches. Um, also, the automation concept based on a design flexible that can be uh, either a U-shape or E-shape or uh, L-shape uh, where some uh, where uh, an instrument can be connected uh, to the track system from both sides based on the setting of the lab itself. Also, it has the ability to interface with, diff with the different vendors to uh, to reach to the maximum um, uh, um, uh, efficiency of uh, of uh, of the track uh, or the automation uh, system. Also, it should have a middleware that can help in many things, uh, which we will discuss later like auto verification of results and auto retrieval of samples. So what is the uh, benefits from automation? Again, uh, it's very important uh, to, in helping to standardize the sample process and testing to improve patient care and eliminating uh, uh, errors. Also, it helped to increase productivity by reducing the human input, uh, which will make uh, the productivity uh, higher. 
and also help to standardize and decreasing turnaround time to help to uh, uh, standardize it and compare it between month and month. Also, it helped to eliminate the need for stat labs. In our lab, uh, our uh, median uh, turnaround time for stat labs is 48 minutes, uh, which indicate that we don't need to have a stat lab and extra money and extra efforts and staff for uh, running the stat lab. Also, uh, it helped to reallocate uh, the staff for optimization of manual tasks and also to expand the services for uh, tests that cannot be automated, like rare tests. Um, when you come to establishment, uh, the uh, one million dollar uh, question is how to start, from where I can start uh, for the establishment of, of automation in my lab. You have first to think about what is your scope of service. Is it essential lab services or is it a central laboratory where you receive samples from peripheral uh, laboratories or is it a reference uh, laboratory that receives samples from uh, the region that you are in? Uh, also, what is your workload? Is it light or moderate or, uh, or heavy? Uh, you should think about how big is your lab space, including supply store and cold room, to accommodate the automation system and the needs for the automation system. Uh, also, you should uh, map your uh, lab work. Uh, if 80% of uh, your uh, work uh, flow can be automated, so the automation is a winning for you. In one of the consultation sessions, uh, a customer came to me and uh, he wanted to apply automation in his lab. And uh, I asked him uh, these questions and uh, he answered me that his budget for this uh, system is uh, 3 million riyals, which is around 250 to $300,000. And uh, he's, he's expecting 2,000 samples per, uh, per day. I told him, look, you have to uh, rethink about this project because if, uh, if your budget is 3 million riyals, so the expected load uh, in your lab should be between 50 to 100 samples per day uh, for essential lab services. And if you are planning for 2,000 samples per day, then your budget should be between um, uh, 15 to 20 uh, uh, million riyals. Uh, so it's very important to know uh, what, what do you want and uh, what is your scope of services. Um, there are many challenges that you have to consider when you are uh, sta try, start to establish your, uh, your automation in the, in, in the lab. Uh, the first is to know your budget and the manpower that you have. Uh, and also, uh, you need to know your strengths and weaknesses. Um, and uh, if, you, if you look to your strengths, then it will be your baseline that you will start to build your requirements based on it. And so the vendor should meet your strengths not be below your strengths and also find the solution to solve your weaknesses in, in your workflow. Uh, uh, so if you, if you know your strengths and weaknesses, so you are, uh, you are in the right uh, track. Also, you should involve all stakeholders if, uh, uh, like IT team, uh, biomedical engineering, civil engineering, and uh, supply uh, chain team as well, because those stakeholders will help you in build the, uh, the right requirements that meet your needs uh, without any obstacle that may arise during the establishment and installation of your automation. It's very important, uh, and I, I'm emphasizing on this because uh, many experiences have uh, arised and a lot of obstacles arise when uh, some of stakeholders was not involved in the establishment of the automation systems. Also, you need to design the requirements carefully based on, uh, as I said, strength and weaknesses inside your, uh, your lab. Uh, also, you need to plan the transition state uh, between the old system and uh, uh, the new system uh, with maintaining the quality of services and safety of staff. It's very important to think about this as well. And also uh, monitoring the go-live period uh, with help of the vendor and, uh, and the stakeholders as well. So in the next uh, eight minutes, I will uh, uh, focus on considerations uh, that should be taken uh, when you are uh, uh, planning and establishing your uh, automation. So uh, the first thing is standardization is the golden word, meaning that you have to standardize your requirements based on your needs. What is uh, things that you must have in the automation and what are the things that it's desirable if it's there, it's okay, and uh, it's better, but if it's not there, it will not affect your workflow. So it's very important that uh, you standardize your, your needs. Uh, also, uh, you should know the performance uh, measures. 
for example, the productivity uh, of, of the machine. You have different type of analyzers. Some analyzer, the, the claim of the vendor is 1,000 tests per, per hour, while the other one is 800. But if you look to the, to the, to the uh, dimensions of the machine, the first one dimension, let's say it's 1.5 by 2, so the uh, total uh, test per hour is 1,000 divided by 3 meters squares, mean 333 tests per hour. But if the other one is 1.5 by 1.5 and the uh, throughput is uh, 800 tests, so uh, you divided 800 by 2.25 meters square, the productivity will be 350 tests per hour. So the small uh, analyzer uh, productivity is higher than the, the bigger one. Also, you should look, about, look up, uh, uh, also to the turnaround time of the first result released. Um, uh, which will help you in deciding the, uh, uh, the, the right analyzer for your turnaround time uh, inside your lab. Also, the footprint, you don't want to end up with a, a huge uh, machines that make your lab uh, very crowded. Also, you need to locate the automation bottleneck. The bottleneck in the automation is the slowest part of the automation. For example, if the track is 5,000 sample per hour, but the centrifuges, uh, you have two centrifuges that the throughput is uh, 300 sample per, per, uh, per hour, uh, uh, taking into consideration 10 minutes of spinning. So your throughput of automation or uh, track is uh, 600 sample per hour. You should, so you should look to this uh, carefully. Also, uh, the ability for uh, priority options for stat and super stat sample, either through the uh, automation, tra the track itself, or um, uh, directly to the machine itself. Also, you should have the on-the-fly on loading of reagents uh, uh, better than stopping the machine to uh, fill it or load it with, with reagents. Uh, uh, again, um, uh, when, you look, when you look to system requirements, you need to consider many things. For example, method limitations uh, like uh, uh, biotin effect uh, you should look at, at this um, uh, think, uh, uh, think very, very uh, carefully. And also the detection limit that should be comparable with the clinical decision. For example, if the method uh, detection limit of the method is uh, 0.4 millimole per liter and the clinical decision, uh, the clinical decision uh, is uh, uh, 0.1 uh, millimole per liter. So uh, this method is not of good use for uh, clinical um, uh, decision in, 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 in your uh, setting. Also, you should look to the calibration frequency. Uh, if the calibration frequency is higher, so a lot of efforts needed to uh, for documentation and follow up of the, uh, uh, of the uh, performance of the machine. Also, you should uh, look to carry over how to avoid it, either by using, if the machine use uh, extra washing step or using disposable tips and cups for wide uh, AMR range. Uh, also, the method validity. You should look also uh, because uh, all accreditation bodies like Sibahi and CAP require uh, the lab to have external quality control uh, and proficiency testing. So you need to look to the beer labs that using the same method. You don't want to end up with uh, many methods inside your lab that you need to split samples because you, uh, you don't have enough beer uh, labs that um, uh, you have uh, to compare with uh, for your method. So you will be end up uh, sending many samples for uh, split samples uh, for comparison between your method and, uh, uh, and the other hospital method. Also quality control requirements. Um, uh, how many uh, analytes in the common QC? How many special QC do you need? Uh, are they ready to use or, or lethalized? Uh, for maintenance time requirements, how long it takes to do the daily, weekly, and monthly maintenance, and how long it takes to do the BBM, uh, the periodical preventive maintenance. Uh, those considerations are very important. Also, uh, uh, supply requirements, you should look to uh, uh, methods that it's FDA approved. Uh, uh, be careful because and sometimes the vendors say that this uh, method is under, or this test is, is under, uh, uh, development, we are waiting for the FDA approval. Uh, you should make sure that all uh, are FDA approved. Uh, you don't want to send a lot of uh, tests uh, for send out. Also, you, uh, you need to have how much? Two minutes. Uh, I have seven minutes here. 
Okay. Um, uh, you should have a uh, unified lot number uh, with extended expiry date, uh, for example, six months at least. Um, also, the pack size based on your workload, uh, small size for the uh, light workload and uh, large pack size for the high workload. Also, you, you need to uh, look to the agents. Uh, is it need preparation or is it ready to use? Um, uh, taking into consideration the agent handling, uh, room temperature or fridge or uh, freezer. Also, the stability of, uh, uh, of the myth of the reagent on board, uh, very important to have the, the longer, the better. Uh, the amount and size of disposable accessories, uh, you don't want your lab to be very crowded. Uh, ability to aliquot from all type of primary tubes, very important. Ability to handle pediatric samples as well. Uh, the ability to detect clot and uh, sample level, uh, some, and also uh, the refrigerator, uh, should have automatic retrieval to improve uh, workflow, for example, uh, add on testing. And also the ability to detect uh, the sample integrity, for example, hemolysis, uh, ecteric, and lipemia. Uh, again, it's very important to train your staff and biomedical engineer on the automation to, uh, for, uh, to be able to troubleshoot things that it's easy to, uh, to fix inside your lab than waiting for the vendor engineer to come and fix it for you. Uh, also, uh, uh, in terms of laboratory automation system requirements, uh, it's very important to have uh, sample reflex, auto dilution, repetition, uh, 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 repetition for critical results and other reasons, and add on testing. Uh, also, the ability for calculated test, um, uh, the ability to locate and retrieve sample from the archive. Also, very important to have a dashboard to monitor the automation real time productivity, like turnaround time and um, uh, quality of analysis like moving of average. Uh, reagent mapping also for optimization of reagent uh, management. Uh, the vendor should help you for participation, external quality control assurance and proficiency testing. The automation should have minimal heat emission, noise generation and water consumption, and clear plan for transition state between old system and new automation. Uh, also, they should help in renovate of lab area. Again, I'm emphasizing on this, you should invest in your staff, involve them in the whole process, and ask the vendor to support continuous education uh, in the lab. Uh, finally, uh, vendors uh, should give presentation for the proposal that he is uh, proposing and also help you to a site visit for other laboratories where vendors have success successful illustration. Finally, it is important at this stage to focus on the requirements identified by workflow mapping and not to allow the vendor to try to sell equipment that may not uh, be necessary. To conclude, uh, uh, when one size doesn't fit all, what is fit for uh, your friend in uh, laboratory or your colleague's laboratory didn't mean that it fits uh, with you. Also, uh, you should know your needs, uh, strengths, and weaknesses. Uh, involve stakeholders and uh, uh, standardize your selection method. Uh, consider IT solution very important and plan your transition state carefully and training, training, training you should invest in your human capital because they are your uh, treasure. Thank you.